the first speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, uh, I think some of you have already been here in the previous school, so you don't, you know the format. But just to remind, uh, just to tell the new people who have just come for the first time here, uh, you will notice that most of the days there is a discussion session in the afternoon. Now that's really part of the school, uh, because many times, because the lectures are quite condensed, one hour, uh, the lecturers do not have time to, you know, answer many of the questions in detail. Okay, so detailed discussion should be postponed to the discussion session. And uh, indeed, in the previous uh, Springer schools, students have learned a lot from the discussion sessions. In fact, sometimes even more than the lectures themselves. You know. So I would really encourage you to attend all the discussion sessions and take part actively. So with that, I would uh, uh, invite uh, the first speaker, Professor Hartman, and he'll be giving lectures on the average null energy condition in QFT. Morning. Okay, I guess it's working. Okay, thank you uh, to the organizers and to ICTP for hosting this. It's great to be here. I look forward to meeting uh, the students uh, here from all over the world. Uh, so, so please do um, come introduce yourself to me uh, after the lectures. Please interrupt during the lectures. Um, I'll probably postpone a lot of questions so that we can get through lots of material, but um, don't hesitate to raise your hand or just shout out since it's a pretty big room. Um, just stop me and, and we can clarify things as we go. So the topic of these lectures is the averaged null energy condition, or ANEC. I'll try to write big. Is this big enough? Good? OK. I'll probably start writing smaller, but um, stop me, and I'll start writing big again as soon as I remember. OK, so um, <clears throat> when you learn general relativity, you usually come across some energy conditions. They show up in all the GR books that go by names like the strong energy condition, the weak energy condition, uh, the dominant energy condition, the null energy condition. And these are usually introduced uh, in textbooks as ways of uh, proving theorems. They're assumptions about local energy density uh, produced by matter that allow you to say things about space time. So all the facts that, we, that, that you're familiar with, uh, like the fact that black holes have to have singularities or the fact that uh, there has to be a Big Bang if we trace our universe backward, or the fact that we can't build time machines. Uh, all of these statements about space-time, the structure of space-time, and what it can and cannot do uh, are based on some sort of energy condition. So these are great for proving theorems, but all of these energy conditions are wrong. Okay, so they're all violated. Uh, the strong energy condition uh, I, I won't get into too much about what these are since they're wrong. Uh, the strong energy condition is, is just not true at all. It's very, a massive scalar field would violate the strong energy condition. The weak and dominant energy conditions are violated by negative cosmological constant. The null energy condition um, is also wrong, violated, that is, um, but it's in a little better shape. So let me tell you what that is. I'm going to pick conventions, and this will last throughout the lectures, that U and V 
are uh, null coordinates in Minkowski space. So u is t minus y, v is t plus y. Then the null energy condition uh, states that t u u is everywhere positive or non-negative. Of course, it it's, can be phrased covariantly. Uh, I'll, I'll pick u u just to keep the notation simple. Uh, but the statement is that the stress energy density dotted into any null vector would be everywhere positive. Uh, so this one is in better shape because it's obeyed by ordinary classical matter. Any reasonable classical matter you can come up with obeys the null energy condition. But it's still violated by quantum effects. So let's see uh, why that is. So for example, if you have a free scalar field, then classically, du is up to some factor, just d phi, du phi squared. The guu component of the metric is zero. There's no null null piece. So uh, this is just obviously positive classically because it's a square of something. Uh, but in the quantum field theory, TUU is an operator now. So it's the normal order d phi squared, where phi is now the field operator. And uh, because of this, so the thing, the thing inside uh, is still something times its conjugate, so it would be positive if it were just that. But the normal ordering uh, mixes around some of the terms, it adds some new terms to this, and this is just not the square of anything anymore. And uh, it's easy to cook up quantum states where it's not positive. So uh, it's not a perfect square, it could go negative, and indeed it does. For example, uh, if you take a state like the zero particle state, a superposition of the zero particle state and a two particle state, uh, then what happens when you calculate this, you plug in, so you plug in for the field operator in terms of A and A daggers, uh, you do the normal ordering, pick up some extra terms, and you can easily check that in a state like this, those extra terms uh, dominate the, uh, the null energy, give the only contribution, and can come with either sign depending on how you pick epsilon. A, a, uh, another easy example to see where the null energy condition is violated uh, would be in the Casimir. effect. So in the Casimir effect, uh, you have two conducting plates, and between the two plates, there's just a, a constant negative energy density. So obviously, uh, the null energy condition is going to be violated in that region. So again, that's quantum effects coming in, and you could trace it back to these normal ordering terms. these local energy conditions, and in fact, this isn't just a failure of imagination, uh, there's no local energy condition that's true in quantum field theory. Uh, so all these are violated. Now, on the other hand, total, total energy is positive in quantum field theory. Otherwise, uh, we'd have a problem. It wouldn't make sense. It would be unstable. So the total energy integrated over all of space is positive. The local energy can go negative, um, but um, actually, and this is the statement of the average null energy condition, there's something in between, which is the statement that taking this null energy TUU, and integrating it over a null line, U from minus infinity to infinity, Uh, 
gets rid of those offending terms. This gets rid of those normal ordering terms that led to negative contributions in the scalar. And if you uh, calculate, if you plug in the, uh, the quantized scalar field into this expression, then when you do the integral, uh, you'll find something that's like integral dk, ak, e to the minus ikx, ku, mod squared. So in the scalar field, uh, we've just, you could just prove by direct calculation uh, that once you integrate, this, positive, this is a positive quantity. More generally, uh, we could ask whether this is true in any quantum field theory, and that's going to be the subject of these lectures. So this is the ANEC, the average null energy condition, is the statement that this operator, E, is non-negative uh, in any state. In other words, it's a, non it's a positive operator. Yeah. Uh, so this is, this is a definition. So I'm, I'm defining the integrated null energy to be E. And all I've said so far is that if you, if you just explicitly calculate this for the free scalar, uh, you can check that it's, that it's a mod squared of something and, and check that it's positive. So at this point, this is just an interesting observation that, hey, uh, we found negative energy, but uh, it turns out we don't have to integrate it three times. We don't have to integrate it over space. We only have to integrate it once. So the total energy through this, the energy flux on this single null line is enough, is enough to get a positive quantity. And then um, the subject, and then we're going to try to understand why that's true in general. That's the, that's the goal. That's right. That's right. So in space time, um, you know, there's, in space time over here, there's a transverse direction which sort of comes out of the board. Uh, but we've just picked a single null ray, say through the origin, and uh, integrated the stress tensor along that null ray. Sorry? Uh, can we have a similar statement like this integral? Um, no, not, no, they're violated, uh, no, I don't think so. They can be constant and they, they can be violated in a constant way by a cosmological constant, so I think not. Well, at this point, it's just a coordinate. I could, I could define this in a covariant way by, by saying that this is an integral of a null ray of t dotted into the, uh, we could have an affine parameter here and then dot into the usual normal. Uh, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just use the u coordinate. Um, yeah, good. So, so, um, this, so this condition was introduced in GR, and it was a statement about curved space and understanding things in curved space. But I'm going to focus exclusively on Minkowski space. So uh, just, the state, just the question of whether this statement is true, already, already, it was motivated by gravity, but already the question of whether this is true in ordinary quantum field theory, in ordinary flat Minkowski space time, is already a very non-trivial question about quantum field theory, and that's where I'm going to stop. Um, there's a proposal for something that's true in curved space, but it's, uh, but no, there's no proof of it. So the outline of these lectures um, is I want to describe three proofs or derivations of The ANEC
in interacting quantum field theories, including strongly interacting quantum field theories. So, just in five minutes, we did the proof for the free scalar, uh, and uh, other free quantum field theories were considered in the 90s, and uh, it was checked uh, that this seemed to be a true statement. But it's been understood in the last few years that this is actually a, a fundamental property of quantum field theory, uh, and that's been understood from several different angles. So the different angles are First of all, causality. Uh, so this will be based loosely on a paper by me, Sandipan Kandu, and Amir Tajini from a couple years ago. The second method, and these are out of order, I've reordered them for the lectures, these are not historically ordered. Uh, but the second method that we'll talk about is holography. This will be based loosely on a uh, paper by Kelly and Wall from, I think, 14, although I didn't write down the number. Uh, and the third will be from the point of view of quantum information. And this is based on a paper by Faulkner, Lee, Barkar, and Wong from 16. So I'll just come ask me for the, for the full references, or I'll post some notes at some point so that you have the references. Uh, but they, all, all of the papers have no energy in the title, so they're not too hard to find. Okay, if we're going to prove the NEC three times, then uh, we better have some good reasons to do that. So before we jump into it, I'll give a few words of motivation about why we want to understand the NEC. Uh, so there are uh, roughly, roughly three. Uh, so first of all, this is a fundamental property of quantum field theory, we're really, we're not talking about anything exotic here. So as I said, we're gonna be working in flat space time, we're just considering general quantum fields. Uh, so the ENEC uh, is, is a consequence of unitarity, It's a very fundamental property of quantum field theory, but it's a, it's a uh, repackaging of unitarity in a very special way that seems to have lots of interesting consequences. It applies uh, essentially to all, well, actually to all reasonable quantum field theories, including uh, everything from, say, the standard model to, to StatMEC uh, models like the Ising model. In fact, there are predictions that you can make using the ANEC, uh, predictions for, uh, for quantities in the Ising model, which were new predictions from the ANEC and have been confirmed numerically, so these are, these are um, things that, in principle, you can even go out and test. The second reason uh, is the fact that there seem to be so many different ways of thinking about it, just in itself is very interesting. So uh, what we're going to see is that this is related to understanding quantum fields in the highly boosted limit. 
makes sense. We're talking about integrating over a null line. So this is going to be connected to properties of quantum field theory at null separation. And what we'll see is that quantum field theory at null separation, even in, in the strongly interacting case, is especially tractable. Okay, so when things are strongly coupled, QFT is hard. But in the light cone limit, it's not so bad. So for example, uh, we usually think of ADS CFT as something sort of mysterious and difficult and hard to map between the two sides. But in the light cone limit, uh, everything is solvable. It's a solvable limit of ADS CFT where you can explicitly map bulk and boundary. And beyond that, um, it's a limit where holography is actually even much more general. So ordinarily, holography is a statement about uh, a certain class of conformal field theories. You have to have large N and a large gap in the operator spectrum. But in the light cone limit, uh, that's actually not even the case. Actually, holography uh, is essentially just a derivable exact statement about conformal field theory uh, as long as you're restricted to the light cone limit. The third region, reason, and I won't uh, really get into this in these lectures, uh, but uh, is the connection to gravity, quantum gravity. So, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a coincidence that the ENEC was first discovered or discussed in the uh, GR community. This came from relativists. Uh, it seems to be a, fundamental, a, a fundamentally important fact about how quantum fields couple to gravity. And uh, so, it turns out that the ANEC is essential for, for getting things like causal structure and curved space-time to work. It's essential for getting black hole thermodynamics to work. Uh, and is, it also underlies some of the more recent work on uh, thermodynamic and entropic and, and other relations in quantum gravity, um, things like uh, quantum focusing, the quantum null energy condition, various other uh, things that you may have heard about. Okay, so um, the first, so that's, that's uh, sort of the introduction. And uh, the first one that I'm gonna talk about now is the causality-based argument for the ANEC. And I really, wanna sort of, I really wanna start at the beginning um, and set up the background here. So we're gonna spend a while doing that. It'll be a while before we really get to uh, the argument. Um, but let me just draw a picture giving the uh, sort of the strategy. So very rough idea of what the strategy is, uh, is we're gonna look at correlation functions. In Minkowski space, it's working in real time. So this is my Minkowski space again, and we're gonna look, uh, we can think about four point functions, although they could be higher point functions. And uh, four point functions are related to causality uh, because you can think about them as sort of an experiment where two of the operators create some kind of background. Say they create some excitations here. So they create some background. And then you can ask whether in that background created by those operators, you can ask whether you can send a signal from here to there. So you can think of some of the operators as a background and the other operators as a probe. And then you can set up an experiment to test whether uh, that situation is causal, to test whether uh, signals can bend out of the light cone in the presence of this background, yeah. What do you mean by background? Yeah, I don't wanna, I, I don't mean much by it. I just, it's just words for, th for the question was what does background mean? Uh, that's, we'll get into that. Um, but I just mean in the very loose sense of 
this is some kind of excitation that this probe has to go through. So you can think of this, these operator insertions as creating some cloud of junk or particles or, or something, and then this probe has to interact with that stuff uh, as it propagates. So just in the very loose sense, and we'll see precisely what's meant as we go along. Uh, so we need to understand correlation functions, and especially uh, we need to understand correlation functions in this highly boosted limit. So that's going to be the first topic, uh, and I'm going to sort of start from the beginning and discuss both of these things, just general properties of correlators in QFT, including some uh, things that, that, that are um, important but not usually stressed in QFT courses, and especially focusing on the light con limit. I will mostly assume uh, that we're in a conformal field theory. For this, for this part one, that we're going to be in an interacting conformal field theory. Most of what I say uh, also applies to conformal field theories in the UV that are deformed by some relevant operator. Uh, but it's important that there be an interacting fixed point in the UV. Since we're going to be working in the null limit, uh, that's, that's a limit where things are effectively close together. Uh, so it's effectively <laughs> controlled by the UV fixed point, and relevant operators won't get in the way. But just to keep things simple, I'll assume it's conformal. Okay, so the first thing we want to get into for background is properties of correlators in the null limit. The essential tool to understand this is going to be the operator product expansion. So the operator product expansion uh, says that if we have two operators, psi of x1, psi of x2, inserted, say, here and here, that uh, you can basically that you can zoom out. Okay, if you zoom out, if you have two operators inserted and you zoom out on this picture, you look at that from very far away, uh, then you'll just see some local excitation, or some local operator, rather. And uh, so that means that you have to be able to at least approximately write this in terms of the local operators of the theory. So there's a sum over the operators of CO psi psi of x12, O of x1. I've expanded uh, in operators at one of the points chosen arbitrarily, but that's not, it doesn't really matter which one or where. We could expand uh, about the center or anywhere else nearby. So dimensional analysis already tells us quite a bit about what this sum has to look like. So uh, on the right hand, on the left hand side, uh, if suppose that psi has mass dimension delta psi, uh, then we need the mass dimensions on the right to add up to two delta psi. So the only thing that we can write, so let's say let's say we have a, a uh, an operator showing up in that sum with a bunch of indices, mu1 to mu l. Those are the Lorentz indices for a spin l operator. 
then we need to uh, contract those indices with something. So the only thing available to contract indices is going to be the distance or the separation x1, x1 minus x2. So there's a x1 minus x2 to the mu1, x1 minus x2 to the mu2, all the way up to L. Now, what else can we stick in here? Uh, well, we need to get the dimensions to add up right, and the only other thing we can stick in is x1 minus x2 um, the x is the distance from x1 to x2. And uh, just counting up dimensions on the two sides, we need to get 2 delta psi That gives us all of the right mass dimensions, so now we have to get rid of everything else. So there's a plus delta O to cancel off the dimension of this one. Uh, then there's a minus the spin of O, L, uh, to cancel off all dimensions from these. Um, and finally, there could be some constant coefficients, C, psi, psi, O. So in a general Q of T, uh, this is just the most general thing that we can write, the most general sum we can write down that makes sense by dimensional analysis. Uh, I've, I've written this last thing as a function. Uh, if there were, if you could make, if you had a theory with a mass scale, then this could be a function because you can make a dimensionless function in a theory with a mass scale by multiplying m by the length. Uh, but in a CFT, there are no masses. So uh, there is no dimensionless function that you can stick here. The only thing you can put is a constant. And that constant is the OPE coefficient. So this is what the OPE looks like in a conformal field theory. Yeah, psi here is a scalar. That's right. So there are two nice things that happen in CFT. One is that this is not a function, it's just a number. Uh, the other thing is that we understand quite a bit about when this converges and when it doesn't converge. The statement is not quite, often you hear the statement that in, in, CF, in CFT the OPE converges. Uh, that's true uh, under the right circumstances. It's true in Euclidean signature when there are no other operators nearby. It's not true in Lorentzian signature in the kind of situation that we're interested in. So we're mostly going to not be dealing with convergent OPEs, uh, but they still make a good asymptotic series, so you can still use them to approximate uh, these operators. Well, sort of. Uh, the Anik and Euclidean signature is, is captured by unitarity, which has a Euclidean statement that I'll talk about. Uh, but it's very hard to get at the Anik from Euclidean signature. It's a, it would, if, if, from the point of view of a Euclidean quantum field theorist, the, the kinds of quantities that we'll write down can all be stated in terms of the Euclidean theory. But they would just be, they would seem like totally crazy things to talk about in the Euclidean theory, and they're very natural things to talk about in the Lorentzian theory. So in the Euclidean OPE limit, by which I just mean that uh, we have, so let's put our operators symmetrically. Uh, we have an operator psi of uv and another operator psi of minus u minus v. 
The usual OP limit that people talk about is one where we just move the operators together uh, in, the, in the ordinary direction. That is, we send u and v both to zero simultaneously. And uh, in this limit, we can think of all of these all these position dependent things here is scaling to zero at the same rate, so it's easy to figure out which terms dominate. And uh, basically there's an x1 minus x2 to the uh, minus two delta psi plus delta O. Uh, the minus L's here cancel against the L factors of position showing up here. Uh, so each term comes with distance to this power. So the lowest delta O's, the lowest dimension operators, are the ones that dominate the expansion. This is often what makes the OPE useful at short distances is that uh, if, so say, say you have a conformal field theory or someone hands you some data about a conformal field theory, but they don't, hand, they don't tell you everything about the conformal field theory, they just tell you the dimensions and uh, maybe the dimensions and OPE coefficients of some low-lying operators, then you can already get a good, very good approximation by looking at those operators um, in the OPE. But what we're interested in is not that limit. It's the light cone limit. The light cone limit means, uh, so here's my u axis and v axis. Again, we're gonna start with our operators placed symmetrically. But now I'm gonna take these together in the, in, I'm gonna take them to zero distance, but while maintaining a null separation. So we can do that by sending this one up here and this one down here. This is the limit v to zero with uh, u held fixed. Then the limit v to zero with u held fixed, um, we get, so the, the distance squared, x1 minus x2 squared is just minus uv. So we get a factor of minus uv to the minus delta psi plus delta O minus LO over two. Uh, and then what we get for those other things depends on what indices show up on our operator. In the Euclidean limit, all the different components of the operator were showing up in the same order. But now that which component you're talking, which Lorentz component you're talking about is gonna matter. So say we have an operator with a bunch of u indices and a bunch of v indices with h of these and h bar of those. There could be other, there could be other transverse directions as well. Those won't affect the conclusions here. Um, if we have h of these and h bar of those, then that means we get a factor of u to the h v to the h bar from those contractions. Okay, so from this we can see two things. And the question, the question here is what are the important operators? So what are the important operators in the light cone limit? Well, um, if we have V indices down here, then those have to be contracted with Vs and we're taking V to zero. So one thing we see is that uh, anything with V indices is gonna be suppressed. The dominant contributions are the things without any V indices. Okay, so V indices 
are suppressed. Uh, and the second thing is that the combination now that's showing up, uh, as, so we're taking V to zero, let's say we get rid of all the V indices, then we have a power of V to the delta minus L over two. Okay, so uh, the expansion is no longer controlled by the scaling dimension. The expansion is now controlled by uh, what's called the twist. So twist tau means dimension, the definition of twist is just dimension minus spin. This means that very high dimension operators can be very important in the light cone limit as long as they also have very high spin. Okay, so in the ordinary Euclidean limit, things were dominated by low dimension. In the light cone limit, things are dominated by low twist. So what are the low twist uh, operators in a conformal field theory? Well, the twist, like the dimension, uh, it can't be too low. It can't be too low because uh, there are unitarity bounds which say that if things have dimensions that are too small, you get negative norm states. Okay, so a unitarity bound These come from demanding that two-point functions are positive, uh, and these tell you, uh, first of all, that scalars have twist greater than or equal to d, d minus two over two, where d is the space-time dimension. This is just saying that Free fields have the lowest twist. So like a free scalar has dimension d minus two over two, and a scalar that's not free can only have a twist that's higher than that. So it's saturated when it's free. Higher spin operators, um, have a slightly different unitarity bound that just says tau is greater than or equal to d minus two. And the way to think about that is that Uh, the lowest, the saturated case, tau equals to d minus two, is, corresponds to a conserved current. So conserved currents have minimal twist, and uh, anything that's not conserved has to have a bigger twist. So for example, if we're in d equals four, and we ask, what are the low twist operators in the theory? Well, then maybe if we have a, if we had a spin, if we had a conserved current, uh, say from a U1 global symmetry, then um, that would have spin one, obviously, there's one index. In four dimensions, it would have scaling dimension three. So tau. Two. We also always have the stress tensor. So the stress tensor exists in any conformal field theory, any quantum field theory, and uh, is always conserved. So this is something with spin two. So 
scaling dimension equal to the space-time dimension, which I was saying is 4 here. So again, has twist 2. So uh, the lowest twist operators in the theory are the conserved currents, uh, but we're not quite done. There are more because uh, we can also start taking derivatives. So take a derivative of t mu nu. When you take a derivative, the spin goes up by one. So now you can make an operator of spin three. Uh, but the dimension, the scaling dimension also goes up by one when you take a derivative. So delta is equal to five. And again, the twist is two. This wouldn't happen in the Euclidean limit. In the Euclidean limit, you take derivatives, the dimension goes up, those are subleading. In the Lorentzian limit, the, the light cone limit, uh, derivatives can be important. And it's, uh, of course, we can keep doing this, d alpha, d beta, t mu nu, um, also has twist two. I'm going to ignore, okay, so, so if we, we ask what are the low twist operators, the lowest ones can be the scalars. I'm going to ignore the scalar operators in the OPE. Um, we can come back to them uh, in the discussion or if people have questions. They won't affect anything that I say. Uh, just because they have spin zero, they don't um, lead to the kinds of terms that we're interested in, and they can all be um, dealt with, but I don't want to carry them around and then and, and have to write them all the time, so I'm just going to ignore the scalars. Uh, now, generically, the only conserved current is the stress tensor. If the theory is interacting, then the only possibilities are the stress tensor and things that are spin one. Uh, the spin one things the spin one currents also, like the scalars, won't affect anything that I'll say. We could keep them, but I'm just going to drop them. So this leads us to a key conclusion, which is that dominant contributions So the light cone OPE as V goes to zero are uh, the following operators. So it's just the stuff that you can make uh, out of the stress tensor. And we said, remember we said that we wanted things that are low twist and that the V indices are suppressed. Okay, so the, the dominant contributions are just T U U and the U derivatives of T U U. So when we expand as V goes to zero, these are the dominant terms in OPE. Yeah, let's see. The, I guess um, since I've only I've only put my scalars in the UV in the UV plane, then the transverse directions you can just absorb into, so I haven't even written the transverse indices, you could just absorb those and those create higher dimension operators. So 
So those won't come in. Yes, I'm about to make that comment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about to make that comment too. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Why what? Spin one oh, spin one currents would also be on this list. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna put, I'm just going to assume that the theory doesn't have a spin one current, but it wouldn't affect any of the conclusions that we're going to reach eventually. Okay, so two caveats, which were the two questions, the first two questions. Um, this would be false. In um, a free theory, in a free theory, uh, you can you can make a tower of arbitrarily high spin conserved currents. So take a free scalar, for example. If you have a free scalar, you can. Make operators like this uh, that are conserved by the by the free scalar equation of motion, uh, and this would be a so by by adding terms like this together, you can make uh, a spin four conserved current, and this would spoil this claim. So these would also contribute in the light cone limit at just the same order as those as those stress tensor terms, but in interacting theory, uh, these conserved currents all go away. So there can't be higher spin conserved currents in interacting theory. Their twist gets increased by the interactions. The other caveat uh, is that this would be false in a two-dimensional CFT. Uh, the reason for that is a little different. The reason for that uh, is because the twist of the stress tensor in two dimensions, the twist uh, is d minus 2. Okay, so the, so the stress tensor has twist zero. And the fact that it has twist zero means that you can make new twist, twi you can make an infinite number of other zero twist things just by multi multiplying together the stress tensor. So you'd also have to include things like T U U squared, T U U to the 10, D U to the five, T U U, et cetera. Just everything you can make out of TUUs would also contribute. And uh, these are also exact, all the, all the currents that show up in the uh, Virasoro algebra. So the existence of the Virasoro algebra in two dimensions uh, is, is the existence of all these extra twist zero operators, and those would also show up. Okay, so so far, to summarize these words in equations, what we've said is that as v goes to zero, the OPE psi uv, psi minus u minus v, I'm going to normalize by the vacuum two-point function of those operators, just to get rid of some factors. is approximately 1. Okay, I didn't, I didn't mention the 1 yet. The 1 is there because the identity, the, you can also just have the identity operator showing up in the OPE. That just always has twist 0, so that just always shows up as a 1. Okay, so that's always the leading term. And then these terms we just talked about, so there's um, putting, just plugging in all our factors from dimensional analysis, we have a minus uv to the d minus 2 over 2. u squared, sum 
m equals zero to infinity, b sub m, u to the m, du to the m, t u u of zero, where the b m are some constants to be determined. This is just putting this, that's just this, this sentence here with all the right factors stuck in for dimensional analysis. So the leading terms are the TUUs and their U derivatives. I'm going to set D equals 4 just so I don't have to carry those Ds around, uh, but the discussion is completely the same in any dimension higher than 2. Uh, the answer is just the C's. I'm going to calculate the B's in just a second. Okay, so. No. Um, so this is, this is the vacuum expectation value. Uh, on the top, by writing, since I haven't written any brackets, no. this is anything. No, yeah. That's Good. Yeah. Okay, so to find the B sub M's, And this is always how you find OPE, is this is always how you figure out what OPEs are, is you plug them into a three-point function. Okay, so that's the, kind of the whole purpose of OPEs is to take uh, complicated things like four-point functions and higher-point functions and turn everything into a statement about three-point functions. And uh, that's how you figure out what the OPE is. In the first place, uh, the, the coefficient this B sub M coefficient is going to show up, like if we were to plug this into a three-point function with a T and then take the expectation value, then all these terms would show up because of the TT two-point function. And in a conformal field theory, three-point functions are known. So I'll write the formula, psi UV, psi minus U minus V, T U U of U three V three is just a known function which you can um, look up in various papers, and it's C psi psi T, or you can just figure it out from uh, conformal invariance. It's C psi psi T two U squared minus two U V to the one minus delta psi over u squared minus u3 squared cubed v squared minus v3 squared. This is just a known function, and uh, we're only interested in the light cone limit. v goes to zero, so we can drop that term. The only other thing you need is the TT two-point function. So the formula for that is TUU of U comma zero, TUU of U three V three is equal to C sub T over U minus U three to the six V three cubed. Again, this is fixed by conformal invariance. CT 
is just some coefficient, is actually, it's a very important coefficient uh, because CT is very roughly some number of fields in the theory or number of degrees of freedom. Like if this were a scalar, then this would be about one. If it were 100 scalars, then it would be about 100 up to some factors of pi and stuff. Okay, so I'm not gonna do the algebra now, but you can imagine what to do next, right? You take this, you take this formula, you put a T here, and then you just evaluate it and make sure it gives the right three-point functions, right? I've given you enough information that you can do this exercise and uh, you'll find B sub M is equal to 240 over CT times M plus three, M plus five, M plus one factorial. Okay, so it's just some number. It's completely fixed by conformal invariance, independent of the theory. In principle, we're done understanding the like Kono PE. This is the answer. You, t you take this, this and you plug it into that sum and uh, you, you're, you've succeeded. So that's the dominant contribution in the like Kono limit. Uh, but it's gonna be very informative to resum this into an integral. So let me write the answer and then I'll tell you what it comes from. So in integral form, the OPE formula as V goes to zero is one plus delta psi over CT. I forgot to mention that uh, C psi psi t is negative delta psi. The reason for that is the Ward identity, so the, the OPE of the stress tensor uh, is, you can, the stress tensor is related to the generator of conformal transformations, so you can go through a standard exercise and derive this. This is one plus delta psi over CT, V u squared, times the integral from minus u to u, du tilde, one minus u tilde squared over u squared, all squared, du u of u tilde, and everything else zero. It's not, it's not totally obvious that you could resum this thing into an integral, um, but it is easy to check. And that's kind of the best I can, that's kind of the best I can do to explain this formula is that you can, so you just take this formula and you expand t in derivatives and you just tailor expand t around zero, then the, the, uh, Integral, then order by order you do the integral. It's totally trivial, just this kernel times powers of u tilde. Uh, and you can just check that that, that, gives the right, that that gives the right thing. Okay, so this is just the statement that this integral against u tilde to the m uh, gives, you the right, gives you the right coefficients. Okay, so uh, that's exercise two. Um, check. that this gives V sub M above. To actually find the formula uh, just sort of requires some guesswork. Uh, you can just try plugging in an arbitrary function there, expand both of them in Taylor series, work out the first three orders, look for a pattern, and then 
uh, try to cook up one that works. That's kind of how to, how to come up with that. Okay, so we're almost at the main conclusion for today. Uh, the, we're gonna take one last step to reach our main formula, uh, which is that now we wanna consider a double limit, which is the limit v goes to zero followed by u goes to infinity. This, is, this limit is not done together, it's done consecutively. So first you take v to zero, then you take u to infinity. Or, uh, in other words, you're working on a limit where v is much less than u inverse is much less than 1. In space-time, that just means that first, so we had our two points. First, we took the light cone limit. So they're sitting practically on, on the light cone here. Uh, but then we're also going to take them to be far apart in, in the u direction. So we're sort of in a limit where they're sitting on the light cone, but they're sitting far apart. You can kind of see what this has to do with the experiment I, I outlined in the beginning, where you want to you want to try to throw a probe through some stuff. This is kind of the kind of the limit you're talking about, right? You're you're throwing it very fast, so it's in the middle limit, and you're going to look at it from far away, so that's widely separated. So in this limit, uh, we can just look at that formula here, and what happens is that the kernel just drops out. Right, so the, as we take u to infinity, the limits of the integral just go to infinity, the kernel just drops out, and we see our friend, the null energy operator. So the formula is now psi uv, psi minus u minus v, I won't write that prefactor again, is one plus delta psi over ct, v u squared times curly e, where curly e is the integral du from minus infinity to infinity, t u u of u at v equals zero, transverse direction set to zero. So that was the main purpose of this discussion. And now you can start to see where the, why uh, we might hope to be able to derive the average null energy condition by looking at correlators in the light-like limit. It's because it really is just the first, op it really is just the most important operator. The null energy operator is the most important operator in the light cone limit in this double limit, which is the limit relevant to doing these, this causality test. So we'll do the causality test tomorrow and derive the statement that this first correction must be positive, and that'll give us the ANEC. Um, so we'll continue with that um, in the next lecture. Okay, thanks.